Well, hello, friends. Welcome to OCC, Aurelia Community Church. We are so glad that you have stopped by online to be with us today. Now, today it looks a little bit different than how it normally does uh, online. Uh, last week, when we were recording the message, there was a massive uh, power outage uh, in the downtown uh, core of, of Aurelia. And because of that, uh, we have had to change things up today and re-record our message. But nevertheless, we, we hope that you are blessed uh, with God's word today. Uh, the text that we are looking at is going to be from uh, the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, verses uh, 4 to 6. Now, as you recall, last week was uh, Thanksgiving, right? And, uh, and, and it's one of the uh, most... Uh, favorite of holidays for me because ultimately Thanksgiving uh, usually revolves around having a turkey uh, in the oven. You know, for years, my uh, annual tradition at my uh, youth groups was the uh, Christmas uh, turkey dinner. And thanks to the good friends of Butterball, I thought I could, uh, people thought I could cook a mean bird, but there wasn't much to it. I just threw it in the oven and that was that. Now, what about you? Are, are you a traditionalist or are you like you, uh, you know, uh, get the bird, you know, you you, you take out uh, all the necessary uh, unwanted parts, that sort of thing, uh, you know, baste it, put it in the oven for uh, hours on end. Or are you like me, you put one of those butter balls in the oven. You know, I was thinking about uh, those turkeys, those butterball turkeys. And I found out uh, last week that they have an online help page. Uh, and, and someone who worked there uh, compiled uh, some of the strangest problems people have uh, when they're cooking turkeys. And you may be astonished with what I found. And here's just a few of them. Uh, for instance, uh, one proud gentleman called to tell staff how he wrapped his turkey in a towel and laid it on the floor and stomped on it, breaking uh, the bones so it would fit in his pan. Another gentleman called the operator uh, to tell him uh, tell the operator that he cut his turkey in half with a chainsaw and wanted to know if the oil from the chain would adversely affect the turkey. A disappointed woman uh, called wondering why her turkey had no breast meat. And after a conversation with the operator, it became apparent that the turkey was lying upside down. And one mom uh, called in and told the helpline operator about her little girl. And she asked if they could slow roast the uh, turkey for three or four days because she liked how the way the house smelled. But the experts at the Butterball turkey line told her that the turkey should only stay in an oven for a few hours and that it wasn't a good idea to leave it cooking for four days. And finally, when a talk line staffer asked the caller, what state is your turkey in? Meaning like how thought it was, the caller responded with Florida. You know, cooking a turkey can be stressful. It can be hard on a person knowing that family's coming over. And in their mind, they perceive that the family would will expect a cook, perfectly cooked bird. But what if it doesn't come out okay? What if it comes out undercooked or worse, overcooked or uh, uh, so burnt that, that it's unedible? And what then? Uh, our text that we're looking at from Philippians calls us to rejoice in the Lord always. And that's kind of hard to do at times. The turkey that was cooked is revolting. So everyone rejoice. In the grand scheme of life, that's a little issue. But what about in, in truly difficult times? When my dad had a massive stroke and three days later passed away in the ICU in Barry, it was hard to rejoice during that weekend. And I'm sure for you in your lives, you experience hard times, difficult times, times of hardship and pain. And when those things happen, I'm sure that the first thing that doesn't pop into your mind is to rejoice or to give thanks. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, his writing overflows with joy and thankfulness. Even though he's writing from prison, uh, unlike his interaction with other churches, Paul had very little to correct the Philippian congregation about. He was encouraged by the believers' concern for him and their faithfulness in living out the gospel. And Paul teaches that the joy of the gospel should rule our lives regardless of our circumstances. And so maybe we can learn something from this today and apply it in our lives when we experience tough times. And let's look at it together. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. It begins this way. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know, over the number of times that I have preached here or have done the announcements, I've enjoyed having some fun. You know, for me, I believe that when we come together to worship, we should be able to express a wide variety of emotions. If you're happy, then rejoice. If you're sad and hurting, then let us come around you and love you. If you're angry or upset, it's okay to give it to God and let him carry your pain on his shoulders. And if you're uh, coming and seeing your friends and having a laugh or two, that's good as well. You know, Jesus began his ministry at a party, and, and I think he wants us to have a good time too. But on the other hand, when our Lord found out his friend Lazarus was dead, he wept. For times, uh, for us, there's times to have fun, but it's also there's times to be serious. And although Paul is speaking about rejoicing, something positive, something fun, this is a very serious passage that many of us can struggle with. And, and I wanted to remind us that there can be a, in the midst of a serious topic that we can have a few laughs along the way. And in light of that, let me tell you about David Page. The, the story goes that for four hours, he held the cylinder in this case uh, seen here in the picture, waiting for rescue or immediate death. After digging up what appeared to be an unexploded World War I bomb, by accident, he pressed the button. And so David Page held onto it, afraid to, that letting go would detonate the device. While holding the bomb, the terrified 40-year-old from uh, Norfolk, England, called the emergency operator on his cell phone, and he even used the call to issue his last words to his family. The woman police uh, operator kept saying that it would be okay, but Paige kept saying to her, well, you're not the one holding the bomb. Uh, first, responders rushed to the workyard in eastern England. Uh, an army bomb disposal experts finally arrived, but the drama came to an abrupt end when the bomb was identified. It was part of the hydraulic suspension system from a Citron, a popular European car. Now, although David Page thought he was going through a very serious dilemma, the Apostle Paul at the time of this letter was going through a real dilemma of his own. And ask yourself and picture in your mind what it would be like to sit in a prison cell and know that you might be executed in a few days' time. What frame of mind would you be in? Would, would one live in a state of depression causing others for uh, one's situation and complaining a lot? What would you write in a letter or, or send in an email or text message to friends and family? Lutheran pastor uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote letters to members uh, of his church from his prison cell until the Nazis hung him about nine days before the end of World War II. And he was only 39 years old. Today, in countries like North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, uh, Sudan, and others are notorious for persecuting and putting in jail Christians, all because they announce that Jesus is Lord. Paul himself is in a similar situation as he writes from a prison in Rome to the Christians who met at Philippi. It looks as though Paul could be executed any day now. His, his future is in the balance. And I don't know what we might say in, in that frustration, but here's what Paul writes to the congregation about life. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Don't worry about anything. And the peace of God will fill your hearts and minds. And we have a tendency to blame others or our circumstances for our problems, right? It, it was like that when I got here. It wasn't me and so on. But Paul reminds us that it is not the situation that we are in that causes our misery, but rather how we handle the situation. You know, I met four people who are among the happiest people one could ever come across. But on the other hand, I met more, both poor and wealthy people who are so mean and suspicious of everyone that they are always miserable. Some people are incredibly resilient and take whatever life throws at them in stride, whether it's a disability, ill health, or loss. And they are so easygoing, it's sickening. 
They can somehow maintain a positive outlook and be content despite everything. But because of their outlook and cheerfulness, it, it, it's contagious and they are a joy to be around. Now, on the other hand, the next time that you're at the supermarket, look at the magazines that are sold by the cashier stands. They are full of celebrities who seem to have everything but happiness. Their relationships fail and they sink into depression and addiction. The key to a happy life is not the situation one finds oneself in, but how one handles the situation. And this does not mean that we will always handle situations perfectly in our own lives or that we'll never go through times of bitter disappointment or depression. Paul is writing precisely because he knows people go through bad experiences like this. And because of that, he, he doesn't want those experiences to take control of our lives. And Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, Paul knows that there are times when one is brought to some valleys. It can be a different shattering event for different people. For one person, it could be the loss of one's home. For another, it could be the end of a relationship, maybe a marriage or friendship, or when death takes a loved one, or when one is diagnosed with a terminal illness. Perhaps it might be the loss of a job or the inability to find another one. It might even be finding yourself in prison. At times like that, we are called to take stock, to count up what remains. And I know it can be hard to do, even in the hardest of times, but we can still find something that is amazing, something to rejoice about, a treasure, something that makes life worth living. And if one is to have a treasure, it will need to come from outside of oneself. It is given to you by someone or something. And so let me share with you what I mean. You know, of all the positions uh, that I've served uh, continuously in, in ministry uh, uh, throughout my throughout my time uh, in the church is is serving with uh, children and youth uh, in children's and youth ministry. Not many kind of pastors will, will want to hear something like that. But and don't get me wrong, like I, I enjoy serving in, in a pastoral role, uh, and and I and I enjoyed serving uh, with youth and and children. I appreciated the children and the and the students that God entrusted to me. Many of whom I still connect with to this day. But if given the choice, it's much easier to preach and talk to a number of adults than than it is to keep a number of six year olds entertained. In children's ministry, whether you like it or not, you get immediate feedback. And here, most most of you, uh, if you're in the congregation or at home, will sit uh, quietly and, and politely uh, until uh, until the service is over. And it's only then, uh, after you leave or you turn off the screen, that you start critiquing the service from top to bottom. And even then, most of the time, I don't hear about it. But kids, they let you know right away. And there were times when I would be having the worst days of teaching at a Sunday school class. And then out of nowhere, a child would run up to you and give you a hug or say that I, that I love you or that you're awesome. And, and then everything that you're dealing with in that moment just goes away. You know, why, why is it that a hug can help erase the grief or frustration that we experience? It's because of love. Listen, when experience the faith and love of a child, it is a pure, unadulterated love. It is uh, that love is pure and, it, and it's honest. And, and so now what we have an idea of what that treasure is like, imagine that times a hundred or by a thousand. And that is the joy that we have in the worst circumstances because we have someone who loves us with a pure love that anything on this earth. We have the love of God that brings about a joy unlike any other. And Paul assures his people the treasure has come from God through Jesus Christ. We can always rejoice in the Lord no matter how terrible our situation. We can rejoice because the Lord is near to us, by us, in us, loving us in all that we do. And because of that, we can say, thy will be done and not mine. He is the one to increase and I am the one to decrease. In Jesus Christ, you are in an ongoing relationship that will never end. Not even death can end it or separate us from, from the God who loves us more than anyone else. In Jesus, we see how we are loved with the greatest love possible. After all, as 1 John uh, verse, uh, 4 says, God is love. The gifts that come from God from outside ourselves 
uh, are, include the resurrection and eternal life with the father in the father's home. Just like the prodigal son with a completely wasted life behind him, we are welcomed home by the father. He never forgets us and the terrible position that we might find ourselves in. God will never kick us to the curb. Once, once is always, uh, one is always accepted as precious because of what our Lord Jesus did for us on the cross. And because of that, we are commanded to do, as verse 5 suggests, to let his reasonableness be known to all. Eugene Peterson puts verse 5 this way. He says, make it as clear as you can to all you meet that, that you're on their side working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up any moment. We can rejoice in all our circumstances because we have Christ as our savior. We look forward to meeting with Jesus in the not too distant future, our Messiah who swapped places with us on the cross. And no matter how bad one situation, we can always lift up one's head, look to the Father and rejoice in the Lord. And next time you feel low, ask yourself whether the reason for your misery is because you've forgotten the focus on, on Jesus Christ, your best friend or not. We can rejoice over many different earthly things like a big win in sports, but our rejoicing will only be temporary. Conversely, we can worry ourselves sick over many earthly things. And Paul knows that. He knows what we are like. And so in his letter, he writes, don't, be, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. You know, Frank Sinatra, a famous singer, his daughter, Tina, uh, recalls her father's un unceasing drive to succeed and make money, even when his health was at risk. She shared that his health was in tatters and his life was mired in financial challenges. But my father refused to stop giving concerts. Uh, I've just got to earn more money, he said. His performances, sad to say, were becoming more and more uneven and uncertain of his me memory. He became dependent on teleprompters. When I saw him at the Desert Inn in Las Vegas, he struggled, struggled through the show and felt so sick at the end that he needed oxygen from a tank that he kept on hand. At another show, he, he forgot the lyrics to Second Time Around, a ballad that he sung a thousand times, and his adoring audience finished the song for him. And she says, I couldn't bear to see Dad struggle. I remember all the times he repeated the old boxing maxim, you got to get out before you hit the mat. And he wanted to retire at the top of his game. And I always thought he would know when his time came. But pushing 80, he lost track of when to quit. And after seeing one or two, uh, one too many of these fiascos, I told him he's, and said, Pop, you got to stop now. You don't have to stay on the road. And with a stricken expression, he said, no, I've got to earn more money. I have to make sure that everyone is taken care of. And after Sinatra's death, there have been constant family battles over his fortune. As followers of Jesus, we don't have to deal with things like that because in reality, friends, through Christ, life has a way of working itself out regardless of our circumstances or our situations. And so give thanks for what you have and not for the things that you don't. Paul in this passage doesn't just tell us what not to do. He also gives us something positive to do, to talk to God about everything, to hand it over to him, to let God do the worrying. He is big enough and he can handle every, anything. And God, listen, God is the God of not only the past and, and the present, but also the future. And we are the ones who have problems with the future, but not God. You know, it's been said that about 90% of the things that we worry about for the future never happen. The other 10%, well, God can lead us through. And so there's no point in worrying about that either. Paul does some uh, does give us something special to do, though. He asks us to thank God for all the help that he has given to us in the past. Our spiritual lives can soon become empty if one does not stop and thank God for life itself and all the delights and joys and pleasures in this world. Sunday school class was once asked to list some of the miracles in the world. And one student put up her hand and said, the whole universe is a miracle. And what a wise statement that is. If you don't think you have something to rejoice about, remember, we have a whole universe to rejoice in. R.A. Torrey once suggested, he said, returning thanks for blessings, 
already received increases our faith and enables us to approach God with a new boldness and new assurance. He goes on to say, uh, doubtless the reason so many have so little faith when they pray is because they take so little time to meditate and upon and thank God for the blessings already received. As one meditates on the answer to prayers already granted, faith waxes bolder and bolder, and we come to feel in the very depths of our souls that there is nothing too hard for the Lord. And as we reflect on the wondrous goodness of God towards us on, on the one hand, and on, upon the other hand, upon little thought and strength and time that we ever put into thanksgiving, we may well humble ourselves before God and confess our sins. Today in our text, Paul's letter reminds us that the Christian life is a preparation for the life to come. It's about letting go of one's past and giving thanks to God and looking forward to the future, a future of real living in our real home. No matter how bad our situation is, we can always let God do the worrying. And so, friends, this week, right, no matter what you're going through, be thankful for all that God has given us, for all that he does for us and all that he will do for us but also, and most importantly, what he has ultimately done for us, sending Jesus Christ to earth to die on the cross for you and me. Friends, be thankful, be blessed, and rejoice. Let me pray for you this day. So, Father God, we do say thank you for this day and the opportunity to share this message online. We pray that... Uh, those listening today would be reminded to uh, count our blessings, to, to rejoice no matter the situation that we find ourselves in, to be reminded that ultimately, no matter what we are going through, God is there with us every step of the way. We thank you for this time together, and we pray that it's been a great blessing to all of those who have heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Friends, have yourself a great week. Be blessed. And we look forward to seeing you again next week online here at Aurelia Community Church.